This episode of Tech News Day is sponsored by Mint Mobile and by Omaha Steaks. DOS attacks, or denial of service attacks, is some tech jargon that most people are actually aware of because it's often the reason behind major outages of our favorite online services. Basically, an attacker figures out a way to flood the service with so many bogus requests that it overloads the service's ability to actually handle legitimate requests, rendering it useless until the attack stops or the victim figures out a way to filter out all the bad requests because there is a limit to the amount of bandwidth that an online service can handle. And boy, oh boy, 10 to 15 years ago, it was really easy to do because there wasn't the proper infrastructure in place for a lot of websites out there. Yeah. Um, so if you were on various parts of the internet, there was a thing called the low orbital ion cannon. Yeah. And you just pointed that at whatever website you wanted to. And well, you shot it. Yeah. It was very easy. Way easy. Uh, but yeah, if that's still abstract and or too abstract and technical for you, imagine there's a, a restaurant and like any restaurant, it has a, a finite number of cooks in that kitchen, enough to handle the typical amount of orders that the restaurant receives. Certain parts of the day are peak hours, but generally it's nothing they can't handle. Uh, and shifts are also, of course, scheduled accordingly. Also, this is a restaurant, so there's a finite amount of tables. And anyone who shows up when those tables are full either has to wait or leaves to eat somewhere else. It's a st system that's been in place for yeah. a very long time. You get it. But imagine that in addition to the customers who show up for a sit-down meal, the restaurant also takes orders via a third-party app. And that those orders have become a bigger and bigger part of the kitchen's workload due to a global pandemic. Now imagine if suddenly, out of nowhere, in the middle of a normal lunch shift, the, no the number of food orders coming in through those app services just skyrockets, creating an ever-increasing backlog of orders that completely cripples the restaurant's kitchen. That'd be crazy if that happened, but yeah, what you just described is exactly what happened last week. An IRL denial of service attack on basically every restaurant in New York City that accepts orders via Grubhub, causing food orders to just come in way faster than any restaurant could possibly fulfill them. Low orbital food cannon. Mm -hmm. So how did this happen? Who was behind this? Was it those sneaky, sneaky Russians? I bet it was them. Uh, no, actually, despite feeling like a cyber attack for the restaurants affected, the perpetrator of the Grubhub denial of service attack was none other than Grubhub. Because mm. turns out Grubhub had promoted a very special event for Tuesday, May 17th. Using the promo code Free lunch between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m., Grubhub users in New York City would get $15 off their orders. Mm. Now, if you've ever actually eaten in New York City, $15, it's not exactly enough to cover lunch. Calling this a free lunch, come on, what are you doing? But mm -hmm. it's a hell of a deal, even if you still have to pay some additional fees. Sure. It's a great idea for getting a bunch of people to use your app all at the same time. And hey, it, your servers, they can handle all that extra traffic. No big deal. But surely, if you're offering a huge $15 off deal for a limited window of time, I mean, you're going to give the restaurants a, a little heads up about that, right? A little knock on the door, a little flyer, a little email blast, hey, anything. things are going to get a little crazy tomorrow. Well, apparently not. And the 450,000 New Yorkers who placed 6,000 orders a minute during this promotion were a complete surprise to the restaurants actually responsible for fulfilling those orders. Whoops. And uh, before you start wondering, oh, well, this is, well, look at all this extra business. It's like, no, no one is prepared for this. Yeah. Uh, a lot of these places that are, you're not even talking about the ghost kitchens. But you're talking about the actual legitimate businesses yeah. who are running actual indoor They're doing seating. table service at the same time, too. Well, it's and like, also it's like there is a finite amount of food you can produce per minute in any of these one restaurants. And it's like, oh, there's no capped limit on how many people can order right now? Yeah, it's like, uh, I think this is a California thing. I don't know if the same is true for elsewhere, but like In-N-Out Burger. Pretty much any In-N-Out in a major city in California, at any peak hour, there's going to be about 100 cars in line. Uh, but, you know, you wait. They're quick about it. Um, things keep moving. But also, it's self-regulating because you drive by and you're like, nah. Yeah. But imagine if all 100 cars in line got to order at the exact same time. Yes, mayhem. It would be mayhem. You'd And you'd probably end up waiting about the same amount of time as you would if you had just been sitting in your car trying to get to the front. But you'd be extra annoyed because you're like, I placed my order and now it's 45 minutes later. Mm -hmm. Where the hell is my food? Yeah. So uh, here's here's the Guardian with more. What were they thinking? That's what customers, restaurants and delivery workers want to know after a surprise promotion by the food delivery platform Grubhub went badly awry and proved there's really no such thing as a free lunch. 
Grubhub's plan was ambitious to feed everyone in New York City and the surrounding tri-state area for free during lunch hours on Tuesday. The platform cited a survey it had conducted that found that 69% nice. of working New Yorkers said they had skipped lunch. Not so nice. But that's exactly what the stunt ended up doing after Grubhub's platform crashed as New Yorkers rushed to place orders. The fiasco left restaurants overwhelmed, delivery workers frustrated, and many customers with empty stomachs. Someone at Grubhub was like, I, you know what I miss? Workers sitting on steel beams hundreds of feet in the air with giant hoagies. Yeah. I miss that. Bring me my lunch pail. Yeah. My wife made a delicious hoagie. We're food. bringing lunch back to New Yorkers. Yeah. Uh, and though Grubhub insists that they gave advance notice to all their restaurants about this, the actual restaurants, they don't seem to have gotten that message. I'm sure it got filtered in with all the other spam that Grubhub sends them like every fucking day. It's have like, you ever okay. tried to like find uh, a digital receipt from a, a store that you've ordered from online? It's it's impossible. They send so many emails. It, like, it's insane. Like, I've had places send like five emails a day about like promotional things. Yeah. And it's like you have to scroll. Actually and... finding an invoice is so hard. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, not only were they suddenly inundated with too many orders, their reputations were potentially tarnished because customers might not understand what's happening and just assume that the restaurant is slow and lazy. No bootstraps. And... Nobody wants to work anymore. <laughs> Sorry, nobody wants to work. Even anymore. the people working don't want to work anymore. And, then, and look, you're you're talking about an industry that's already pushed to its limits with yeah. the, the remaining workers who are putting up with it for stagnation wages. And then something like this happens, it's enough for someone to say, screw this and take off the apron I mean, and at walk least, out. I mean, I'm sure it's not great, but I think in New York, if you're going to work in a restaurant, New York's probably one of the better places to do it. I agree, especially if there's actual table service so you yeah. can get gratuity paid directly to you instead of... A alarming amount of people do not tip in their delivery apps. Yeah. It's like, why should I do that? Well, have you seen all the videos of like uh, nightmare scenarios at like a, even a McDonald's where they go up and there's like dozens of food orders there because the grub up people can see what the tip is before. Yeah. And if it's not tipping, they just right, leave well, it there. Yeah. <laughs> I like that they have that ability, but... Uh, yeah. Also, it is weird that you have to tip up front in order to make them believe that you... That, that's because there's no trust. I think Uber Uber Eats hides the tip until afterwards. I might okay. be wrong about that, though. Yeah, but that's the thing is, it's like, all right, well, I haven't gotten the service yet. Why am I going to tip yet? Yeah. So. so anyway, all these people, they're like, hey, I just ordered food. This restaurant must be a shitty restaurant if they haven't uh, made my food yet. Mm -hmm. But that couldn't be further from the truth. These people were working their asses up. They were working to the bone, and The Guardian describes the scene at uh, one such restaurant. Many restaurants were unable to cope. Megan Benson, a worker at a fast casual chicken restaurant in Brooklyn, said that the flood of lunch orders created shortages that spilled over into dinner time, turning the kitchen into a war zone. The restaurant is typically busy from the moment we open the door, and nobody told us about this free lunch thing, she said. Normally it's a tight ship in here, but we couldn't keep up. We had no time to restock anything, so half the stuff was missing or sold out. The phone wouldn't stop ringing because people were calling mad as hell to tell us that they were missing items or they just never got their food picked up. So the Grubhub delivery guys would have to keep coming back. Eventually, my coworkers just got irate with phones constantly being shoved in their faces. Believe me when I say fights almost broke out. Towards the end of the shift, the kitchen was down to just Benson and another coworker who struggled to stay afloat. It was just too much and I had to keep reminding myself out loud, I'm just one person because I had to take the orders and make the orders while my coworker did all the overflowing Grubhub orders. There was nowhere to put them either. The delays meant Benson had to stay well past midnight to clean up, and she finally got home at 3.30 a.m. I just hope we get overtime pay this week, she said. I hope so, too. I, I, I mean... I mean, if she, was, if she was working during lunch shift, yeah, she should, get, she should be getting serious overtime. She may have worked so far into overtime that that was technically illegal for her. To be there that late because if she was working at like noon and you get off at 3 30 p.m uh yeah that's that's a lot i don't know the laws in new york but it's this like is america so i'm hours. sure that someone's looking the other way yeah uh, now it wasn't just restaurants that were overwhelmed grubhub is a delivery app and while grubhub workers knew what was going on and in many cases made out pretty well from a long day of constant deliveries the grubhub app itself did in fact buckle under the pressure of so many orders which affected workers across Grubhub's entire U.S. network, making it difficult for them to connect to Grubhub and actually accept deliveries, and therefore making them a lot less money than they would have if the app actually worked properly. Just across the entire country, just like, all right, well, I was going to do deliveries today, but app don't work. I don't know why. They say something in over in New York City, but I'm in California, mm -hmm. so okay. 
Meanwhile, the app issues caused all sorts of glitches where drivers would arrive to pick up orders the restaurant never received, or they'd actually get the food but then be unable to deliver it. Customers waited hours for food that often never ended up arriving, and one customer the Guardian, the Guardian spoke to says her lunch order got pushed all the way back to 8 p.m. before <laughs> she decided to just give up and go to the supermarket. And, like, that hits on another thing that's just so <laughs> upsetting about this is, like, if you think about how many people are starving just in this country alone, but yeah. Yeah, elsewhere. But they wanted to make sure country. everyone in New York got lunch, and I think probably more people in New York on that day didn't eat lunch than on a normal day. Uh, and just think about the amount of food waste. You're talking hundreds, if not thousands of pounds of food waste. A lot of meals were unaccounted for, and what are you going to do? Like, you work, there's restaurants working their ass off to fill a bunch of orders, like, many of which due to glitches in the software, are never going to get where they're going. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah, there's just so many layers to, uh, It's like Grubhub was like, oh, geez, you know, we get bad press all the time. Now there's these videos going out of people ignoring orders that aren't tipping. Like, what can we do to, like, just renew some goodwill in the company? Oh, I know. We'll give away free food, but hey, just one day. But we'll, we'll try it out in New York, see yeah. how it goes. And they press the free food button and it just like completely cripples not only a, uh, a localized area, but their nationwide network of delivery. It's like standing in front of a crowd of like a thousand people and just throwing money all over the place and causing a stampede. Yeah. Like, what? I was doing something nice. I was giving you all a bunch of free money. And then they're stop, angry because they, they, they didn't get any of the money. So anyway, yeah, this free lunch promotion was all a huge clusterfuck that resulted in customers, restaurants, and Grubhub drivers all being extremely frustrated with each other. Uh, and, at least according to one TikTok video, it also resulted in a, a whole lot of food that restaurants rushed to make, never even getting picked up and ending up just in the trash. Who could have predicted this? I mean, Grubhub probably, if they'd actually spent five minutes thinking about how something like this would actually play out, but... Lesson learned. Let's do a free promotion in like the most concentrated city yeah. in the country. Just a little experiment. Yeah. What happens when a, an island filled with millions of people all gets a free coupon? Yeah. Well, I guess uh, we found out. This is the like digital version of like a crowd crunch. Mm -hmm. At least the yeah. worst thing that happened is uh, people didn't get their lunch. But if they're like hypoglycemic, you know. Could be an issue. Could be an issue. Mm-hmm. But in other news, we recently looked at OpenAI's Dolly 2 image generator, which uses artificial intelligence to convert descriptive text into images that are either photorealistic enough to fool most viewers or look like they've actually been drawn or painted by an actual artist. Now, this sort of thing's been around for a while, but Dolly 2 is much more impressive than what's come before. So impressive that artists and graphic designers and uh, photographers might be starting to worry a bit about their long-term job security not that any of those jobs really had all that much security to begin with. Yeah. But turns out Dolly 2 isn't the only text-to-image generator producing shockingly accurate and realistic results. Uh, Google just announced their own project, Imogen, or Imagine. I don't yeah, know how they want to say it. I, I choose to say it like the... Uh, Imogen. The, uh, is it Irish or Scottish name? Imogen? <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, so they describe Imogen as a text-to-image diffusion model with an unprecedented degree of photorealism and a deep level of language understanding. And at least according to Google's own research, Imogen's output images were rated higher by humans against multiple other methods, including Dolly 2. Unlike Dolly 2, though, Google isn't making Imogen available to the public, at least for now, and they, they cite some pretty obvious potentials uh, for abuse as the reason why. Yeah. Uh, but with that out of the way, let's just check out what Imogen does. Everything you're seeing is an image created by Imogen just based off of a short text prompt. A single beam of light entered the room from the ceiling. The beam of light is illuminating an easel. On the easel there is a Rembrandt painting of a raccoon. Okay. An extremely angry bird. That bird is mad. A majestic oil painting of a raccoon queen wearing red French royal gown. The painting is hanging on an ornate wall decorated with wallpaper. A marble statue of a koala DJ in front of a marble statue of a turntable. The koala has wearing large marble headphones. A giant cobra snake on a farm. The snake is made out of corn. Oh, no. Cool. <laughs> the most American cobra ever. Ever, yeah. A uh, crumb played a duck with a golden beak arguing with an angry turtle in a forest. <laughs> Sounds like a cartoon I've already seen. Yeah. A robot couple fine dining with Eiffel Tower in the background. Okay. A photo of a corgi dog riding a bike in Times Square. It is wearing sunglasses and a beach hat. A cute corgi lives in a house made of sushi. 
A dog looking curiously in the mirror, seeing a cat. Teddy bears swimming at the Olympics 400 meter butterfly event. <laughs> An art gallery displaying Monet paintings. The art gallery is flooded. Robots are going around the art gallery using paddle boards. These all sound like they exist in animes before this. They may. The There's, dog lives in a house made of sushi. You don't understand. It it's amazing. Be, it's a house made of sushi. And he eats his way out every day. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, these are all pretty damn impressive, though. Uh, in pretty much every single one, you can spot at least one thing that's kind of off, if you look closely enough. Mm -hmm. uh, with both this and Dolly 2, the developers are clearly showing off their best work. Uh, but at least in this case, they are also showing off examples that do reveal some of the limitations of their product. Um, but anyway, like Dolly 2, Imogen's website also features a little word prompt dialogue tree thing to show how changing different parts of a prompt changes the output. So you start with a photo of a fuzzy panda wearing a cowboy hat and red shirt playing a guitar in a garden, but you can change photo to oil painting, you can change panda to cat or dog or raccoon, change the cowboy hat to sunglasses, change the red shirt to a black leather jacket, change playing a guitar to riding a bike or skateboarding, and change in a garden to on a beach or on top of a mountain. This just sounds like uh, like a AI, the the caricatures they do at like uh, the beach or amusement Those parks. are the guys that have to worry the most about this, the yeah. caricature artists. I, I want me, but riding on the back of a bear with roller skates on. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I can handle the, the thing you're asking me to do. Okay, uh, open AI. Again, with all these examples, the results are really impressive, but also full of tells that uh, what we're looking at is algorithmically generated. It's especially obvious in the eyes of a lot of these animals, which just aren't right. And again, these are the best examples that they chose to share of what imaging can do, similar to Dolly 2. But honestly, Dolly 2's examples were slightly more impressive. That's not to say Dolly 2 is better. Uh, its pool of users is pretty small, but there have been some interesting threads from users testing its limitations. And it turns out there are a lot of limitations. Faces and eyes usually come out looking creepy and off, but the biggest issues seem to be with actually understanding language and accurately interpreting it, which is probably why a lot of those Imogen prompts were worded a bit strange. They had to try to tell the AI what they wanted a bunch of different ways before it actually gave them something resembling what they wanted. Yeah. You're just testing words, deleting, adding another one, seeing if it works. Yeah, I mean, this stuff, it is kind of a black box, so you, you got to just sort of keep tweaking it whatever way you can. Mm -hmm. Just like, what if I put a comma here? Oh, okay, that did it. Wow. So while artists should Do be- a little coding. Yeah. <laughs> artists should be a little bit startled by all this, but at the stage it's, it's at. It couldn't really function as more than a very useful tool. Nobody is gonna be firing their art department for this. Yes. Someone still needs to come in and clean things up and remove all the weird artifacts and nightmare fuel elements. And that's only once you've actually gotten the AI to understand what you're actually trying to get it to do in the first place. It's still really, really impressive though, uh, but you know, that's where we're at. But what if your goal with this AI stuff is to create nightmare fuel? What if that's what you're going for? Mm -hmm. Well, then the sky's the limit and you're in for a really good time. And an artist named David O'Reilly recently decided to use Dolly 2 and some other AI tools to generate a children's cartoon from scratch. Uh, have a look. Bartek, Bartek, Erto Kushnipi, you will. Kiarda Kakashtopaka, Kiarda Poki, Kapu Kushnipi, Erte, Oishi Bordoko, Pyop, 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 Yep, yep. Oh, Bartak. Wow. Uh, Bartok. Bartok. <laughs> so what you just saw was Bartok. Uh, and what you just heard was not voices from the depths of hell, but rather what an algorithm apparently thinks kids' cartoons sound <laughs> like. <laughs> At the height of Elsagate a few years back, there was speculation that the only way these channels could be pumping out so much incomprehensible children's content was that AI was doing it. And that may have been at least partially true, but Bartak has shown us what AI is truly capable of when given free reign to create children's entertainment. No more training wheels. And uh, interestingly, this is probably not too far off from how very small children actually experience the world. I mean, that's probably what they're hearing <laughs> yeah. when they're that young. Yeah. Just a bunch of nonstop gibberish and colors and shapes with zero context because they're literally babies. They have no context for anything anyway. Yeah. 
Uh, anyways, uh, we look forward to seeing more of Bartok. And David O'Reilly says there's 75,000 episodes, <laughs> which is probably a joke, but ju- could just as easily be true. Yeah, he could pump out Bartoks that'll last us till the end of time. It, I would, you know, at first people are going to get into this ironically, but then they're going to they're going to. This is a thing that could make you evolve a storyline in your head where you think that you see some context clues of like a through line. Yeah. And it's going to drive people to watch it more. And they're going to be like, no, you don't get it. And then the joy of it will be discussing your Bartok theories with others. What do you think is going to happen in the next Bartok? <laughs> I don't know. You've watched Bartok, but have you really, really watched Bartok? Wait till you see Bartok 2. <laughs> uh, but this is like the, the terrifying stuff is really where AI... Uh, succeeds, and I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but um, back when we covered it, I followed the Twitter account that just AI creates death metal bands and album artwork, Yeah, and all the time, whenever I have to go on to tweet something from our channel, it's like top of the list, uh, and it's still cranking out bangers. Like, completely believable shit with just the most horrifically gory album art, but it's not actually gory at all. It's just gives an idea of what it, it just could look feels like. gory. Yeah. 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 There's a bunch of really, really good AI generated art accounts on Twitter. It's, it's almost all abstract art, but people are doing really cool shit with it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I, it's interesting. I like, I, there's a lot of potential to it, but once you get into this stuff, we're like, I would like you to make exactly this. That's when it gets a little weird. Doesn't like taking orders. Yeah. Yeah. We need more bar talk. Yeah. Anyway, moving on now. Humans don't really need robots' help to make terrible art. You know this. The NFT craze proves that humans are perfectly more than capable, more than capable <laughs> of uh, making just god awful art. Uh huh. And while at this point there's really not much point covering every time someone checks their crypto wallet and finds that all their apes gone, a recent high high profile ape theft has some pretty hilarious real world implications. This was <laughs> I I loved and hated the the fact that this story came up because I loved it because it is. It is perfect. It is almost the pinnacle mm-hmm. of what people consider to it was be all, the this use was case. Always going to happen, and yes. I'm glad it's happening. And it and and it's like, well, at least we have the use case for these things. They yeah. can still be used to create uh, other things. And I hated it because I know that people are going to yell at us for covering NFT stuff. But please, this is this is rich. So the Board Ape Yacht Club community and its creators, Yuga Labs, they've long held that the apes you own are your apes to use as you will. And uh, it is stipulated in the the terms and conditions on their website. Um, The actual legal sort of basis of any of this is, uh, it's uh, unresolved as of yet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, that includes, you know, if you own an ape, you can use it in a multimedia project as your personal intellectual property. You can make a show, you can make uh, whatever the hell you want with it. It's your ape Mm -hmm. until it isn't. Now this, of course, it's totally uncharted ground in IP law. And also, if you own a Bored Ape NFT and you plan to use that ape's likeness in a TV show project, a big question is what happens if the ape that you own gets stolen and is no longer your ape? Well, here's BuzzFeed News. Actor and producer Seth Green was robbed of several NFTs this month after succumbing to a phishing scam that inadvertently threw a monkey wrench (laughs) into the plan for his new animated series. The forthcoming show was developed from characters in Green's expansive NFT collection. But in light of the recent hack, the project's blatant crypto optimism has become a tragically ironic reminder of the industry's shadier side. On Saturday, Green teased a trailer for White Horse Tavern at the NFT conference VCon. A twee comedy, the show seems to be based on the question, what if your friendly neighborhood bartender was Bored Ape Yacht Club number 8398? In an interview with entrepreneur and crypto hype man Gary, uh, how do you say his name? Vaynerchuk? Vaynerchuk. Vaynerchuk. Green said that he wanted to imagine a universe where it doesn't matter what you look like. What only matters is your attitude. Unfortunately for Green, what also matters is copyright law. (laughs) And when the actor's NFT collection was pilfered by a scammer in early May, he lost the commercial rights to his show's cartoon protagonist, a scruffy bored ape named Fred Simeon, whose likeness and usage rights now belong to someone else. So yeah, apparently Seth Green is so into NFTs that he made a show featuring his NFTs as characters, which sounds fucking terrible, but hey, this is Seth Green we're talking about. I mean, he created Robot Chicken. He's worked on numerous successful film and TV projects. Uh, I liked him more than I do now that I know that he's all about these NFTs, but you know, how, how bad could a Seth Green NFT show really be? 
Well, phone recordings of the show's trailer that screened at VCon are available to watch online. We're not going to show you because we he's don't. Gonna, he's going to come for that money that he lost with his ape. Yeah, or the the guy who stole the ape, or whoever. That, I don't want to get sued by. I don't want any involvement in any of this shit. Mm -hmm. But we regret to inform you that this looks somehow even worse than we would have guessed. It's a Roger Rabbit style show about a bar whose employees and patrons are a mix of live action humans and animated NFT characters. And despite being pitched as like a comedy, there is not a single funny moment in the entire 90 second trailer. Well, they're saving it for the show. Uh, yeah, it seems mostly just for NFT weirdos to be like, hey, look, that's but look at that. That's a uh... yeah. So, hey, maybe that'll make my line go up. But yeah, you watch it and you're like, it's, it's just it leaves. It leaves no impression, which is especially wild because clearly a lot of money and talent went into this production. This isn't like that shitty Red Ape family cartoon that everyone was making fun of uh, like a, a year ago or whatever. This is a real professionally made TV pilot with like real actors. It looks like a show, but it still also just looks like something that only will appeal to fellow NFT lovers, which, as we know, is not a very large group of people. It's not it doesn't have mass appeal. But back to Seth Green's Bored Ape, which is the star of his show and which he no longer has possession of. Green apparently fell victim to a phishing scam, but because of how NFTs work, he knows exactly where his NFTs are. And he has been begging the Twitter account of the guy who purchased his stolen ape to please get in touch. But uh, so far, no luck. So Seth Green has a whole TV show built around a character he no longer owns. Where does that leave him? Well, back to BuzzFeed. If the current owner wanted to cause trouble for Seth Green, they probably could because that person becomes the holder of the commercial usage rights, said Daniel Dubin, a tax and litigation attorney at Alston and Bird LLP. NFT copyright law can be a particularly thorny issue, Dubin said, and has only begun to be tested in court. A growing number of NFT projects are granting owners the right to commercially adapt their works, which has been a useful strategy for increasing brand visibility, but has consequently introduced a host of legal disputes. Board Ape Yacht Club was among the first to adopt these terms, which led to an explosion of Board Ape merchandise and derivative NFT collections, but also set the stage for bitter copyright lawsuits. Just that agency name alone. I'm just saying. One episode. Harvey Birdman. Bring it back. Let him go to trial with all these NFT thefts. I would like to see that. Yes. But on the other hand, there are laws around purchasing stolen goods, though depends on whether the buyer actually knew that what they purchased was stolen. Seth Green seems pretty convinced that he's in the clear, but this has the potential to actually be a groundbreaking court case if Seth Green or the holder of the NFT decide to sue. Meanwhile, Dan Olson of the YouTube channel Folding Ideas, who's one of the more prominent NFT skeptics, had this fun little thread where he points out some really obvious issues with using bored apes the way that Seth Green is trying to. Anyway, let's have some fun talking about Board Ape Yacht Club apes as characters that holders get the commercial rights to. Let's say we buy number 5777. He's got a photo attached showing a pretty plain old board ape. Basically, anything we do with this character that fails to include the background is immediately open to challenge by the holder of number 5525, as the two apes share all characteristics except background. And yeah, he's right. They're the exact same apes, but with different background colors. And the moment we put clothes on either, we're now stepping on the toes of number 8809 and number 8872, which are also identical in all meaningful ways, just one has a leather jacket and the other a sailor uniform. It turns out that characters churned out in batches of 10,000 by an algorithm haphazardly combining stock characteristics according to a rarity curve aren't a good or interesting foundation to build literally anything out of that isn't just product placement for Board Ape Yacht Club. But also, just imagine trying to litigate that these all constitute unique, distinct characters with clearly defined commercial rights. And uh, here he shows four uh, totally unique apes that are literally the same, the same ape, just with slightly different facial expressions. Yeah, this is all fucking stupid. <laughs> like that, yeah. that, that, was, uh, that was clear from the beginning. And people have tried to do these animated series, and they're all terrible. Um, but yeah, it also raises a pretty important point. If you're going to animate your bored ape in any way, there's probably someone else who owns a different ape making, uh, I don't know, a different facial expression or has a monocle. Yeah. It's different, though. Uh, this is all pretty damn unprecedented, and the legal possibilities are very exciting. We can't wait for the first bored ape intellectual property trial, where opposing legal teams have to explain all this bullshit to a judge and jury of normies, who then have to decide on a groundbreaking new legal precedent for how intellectual property ownership works. It's sure to be way more interesting in this Johnny Depp, Amber Heard trial that's gone on for what feels like a year. I can't believe it's still happening. Yes. It's like six weeks now? 
Yeah, I think just this is this week's the last before like jury deliberations. And or there something. are like a ton of people who sit there all day watching this shit on fucking court TV or whatever the hell. Uh, well, I, Twitch and YouTube has a big like following. It's of, the like, new meta because it is. It's, it's fair use. It's a courtroom. So yeah, all the big streamers are doing it, and it's like you know, on one hand, I'm like this kind of sucks. Whatever. The, the thing that we pointed out every time that we've we've only touched on it very briefly. The things we yeah. point out are like, look, both of them just by listening to the facts that are laid out in the trial I don't, yeah. seem like bad people. I don't Amber like Heard, either of these a lot people. more bad stuff has come out about her in the trial. Um, yeah. So the other thing is that uh, you know the Twitch streamers covering this, it's an abuse trial. It's not something that like yeah, it's this not be fun, fun entertainment. But it's having, not entertainment. Having said that, I find it very rich. The articles from established media corporations who are putting this on blast, who had no problem 25 years ago like OJ with the OJ or, trial or yeah. the Casey Anthony trial or anything like that, just being like, I've seen articles that are like from CNN or whatever, like Twi Twitch streamers, you know, abusing. You're making the justice system a spectacle. Yeah. It's like, I mean, Bitch, who are you? At least this is a civil trial. It's yeah. Like, yeah, there's a, there's a reason like most jurisdictions in the US still won't let you film in the courtroom. It's like, because it, it does turn into a fucking circus. It's like, this is a, a TV show to people. It's not real life. And like, everyone who's uh, gone on the stand on behalf of Amber Heard's legal team has gotten like- Death threats. Yeah, and, like yeah. just for being an expert witness. It's like, do you see the that's guy- That's just something people, do. you can you can hire it as an expert witness. Come on. <laughs> you see the guy that like brought out the graphs of Amber Heard's likability scale? As compared to other... No, I did not see that. <laughs> I haven't been watching this It's like a, a, a Hollywood uh, executive who was just like... Line go up. <laughs> like, here's the numbers on yeah. fan reaction to uh, these names. Yeah, I'm, I'm sick of this shit. It's, it's, it's melting people's brains. Um, yeah. I don't like it. Uh, anyways, we do have more news for you coming right up, but it's time to let you know that this episode is sponsored by Mint Mobile. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by the big wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when you first hear that Mint Mobile offers premium wireless starting at just 15 bucks a month, you might think, what's the catch? But that's just the thing. There isn't one. Mint, Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. They cut out the cost of retail stores and they pass those sweet, sweet savings directly to you. For anyone who hates their phone bill, Mint Mobile offers premium wireless for just 15 bucks a month. Mint Mobile gives you the best rate whether you're buying for one or for the whole family. And at Mint, families start at two lines. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all your existing contacts. Switch to Mint Mobile and get premium wireless service starting at just 15 bucks a month. To get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash newsday. That is mintmobile.com slash newsday. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash newsday. And this episode is sponsored by Omaha Steaks, a great way to get delicious meats and sides shipped right to your door. We're both huge fans of Omaha Steaks. The, the shipments do not last long in our freezers. I recently got a shipment. I've been eating steak every You've been day. Eating good. <laughs> I've been eating real good. <laughs> and summer is the perfect time of year to grill baby grill. Yes. It's not just your internet dads, us, who love steaks, though. Uh, real life dads want steaks, too. And with Father's Day right around the corner, there isn't a better gift than Omaha Steaks. Visit omahasteaks.com, type Newsday in the search bar, and order the Dad's Want Steaks package. For just $99, this limited time package includes 16 mouth-watering entrees that he's guaranteed to love, like smoky, tender, bacon-wrapped filet mignons, gourmet jumbo franks, and their air-chilled boneless chicken breasts. And for a sweet finish, delicious caramel apple tart. My favorite. Yes. Uh, we're just, we're getting so hungry just thinking about them. Can't wait for the next barbecue. And as a special gift for our viewers, when you type Newsday into the search bar in order the Dad's Want Steaks package, you'll also get eight free Omaha Steaks burgers. In this economy? Why are you being an idiot not to order? Yeah. What are you doing? These burgers are full of bold, beefy flavor made from 100% Omaha Steaks. And now they're bigger than ever at a whopping six ounces. Don't wait. Send Dad more than just a gift. Send him an experience that he'll love and can share with you. That's the thing. You get this for Dad, he's cooking for the whole family. Yeah. He might even pass you the spatula. Mm -hmm. He might, <laughs> might even let you take the reins. Son, it's time. <laughs> Go to omahasteaks.com and type Newsday into the search bar and order the Dad's Want Steaks package. You'll get 16 entrees and four desserts plus eight free Omaha Steaks burgers. 
Omaha Steaks isn't just steak, it's the best steak of your life. And that's backed up with a 100% money back guarantee. That's omahasteaks.com, keyword Newsday. All right, let's get back into the news now. And uh, in case you haven't noticed, everything is terrible. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to even count all of the ways. Um, right before we came in to film this, um, the horrific news uh, broke that a bunch of children got killed at school. It, it's hard to even wrap your mind around, although it's not because it just keeps happening in this yeah, country, but it is. It's not surprising or unprecedented. This is like the third mass shooting in 10 days. Yeah. It takes, it's like a punch to the gut and then you're just like, well, what can we do? Um, yeah. On top of that, the imminent repeal of Roe v. Wade and the fact that gas and everything else is too fucking expensive for the average person to live with. Uh, there's also a completely avoidable baby formula shortage, making it extremely difficult for parents to keep their, their fucking babies from starving to death. And there's also a scary new disease spreading across the world uh, when we haven't even gotten rid of the last scary disease that we're dealing with. Yeah, so first up, the baby formula thing. Uh, if you're a parent, it's understandable that you would seek out alternate ways to feed your baby if breast milk and formula are not an option. But in the age of TikTok and Instagram, this means that people are sharing all sorts of DIY baby formula recipes that are potentially really, really dangerous to actually feed a baby with. You know, there's a reason baby formula is the most tightly regulated food product in the US. There's a very delicate balance of nutrients that babies need. Not enough, that's a problem. Too much, that's a problem. Uh, bacterial contamination is a serious issue that can kill babies. In fact, bacterial contamination is the whole reason this problem started in the first place. There's only five major baby formula manufacturing plants in the U.S. and one of the U.S.'s biggest baby formula manufacturers had to shut down its factories because of bacterial contamination. So that's how we got here. Let's not repeat it mm -hmm. in our own kitchens. But anyway, here's a Rolling Stone article talking about the rise of this uh, DIY baby formula stuff online. On TikTok, a recipe using hemp seeds, sea moss, and medjool dates has been viewed more than 10,000 times. In the comments, users ask the original poster, who doesn't claim to be a healthcare professional, for advice on introducing sea moss to a baby who's never had it before. A beautiful blonde TikToker with 16,000 followers posted a video where she's holding an infant on her hip while she explains that she's preparing their bottle with baby formula she made from scratch. The recipe she uses calls for raw milk, which regulatory agencies advise against drinking because of the risk of pathogens, and comes from the holistic nutrition group, the Weston A. Price Foundation, which has also shared misinformation about the COVID-19 vaccine. Sally Fallon Morrill, founding president of the Weston A. Price Foundation, says she developed the recipe with a biochemist to mimic human milk as closely as possible, and claims commercial formula recipes are the ones lacking in nutrients. Quote, I say to these doctors telling us this is dangerous, please don't judge until you've seen how well these babies do, she says. She's, she's doing the fuck around. Yeah. Will she do the find out? A video suggesting a mix of carnation evaporated milk, caro syrup, baby vitamins, and distilled water has a whopping 860,000 views. Another evaporated milk and corn syrup video has been watched more than 120,000 times. The combination is one of the most popular recipes bouncing around social platforms, with many users arguing it's how they or their parents were fed before the introduction of modern formula. And that's not necessarily incorrect. It's just that a lot more babies also used to die. Mm -hmm. uh, before the 1960s, people made baby formula at home from recipes using evaporated milk. But uh, a professor of pediatrics named Stephen Abrams that Rolling Stone spoke to says, quote, most of them did fine, but most of them isn't good enough. It's just flat out not safe. The fact that most babies in the 50s were raised on it doesn't mean that we want to go back to what was an inadequate way to feed babies from the 1950s. The fact that your mother, grandmother, great-grandmother survived on it doesn't mean that your child will. When you do a homemade formula, you're mixing a lot of things together and therefore you run the risk of contamination and you run the risk of getting even the most basic nutrition really wrong. Uh, so maybe don't feed your baby based on what random people on TikTok tell you to. Um, but still, uh, what the hell are you supposed to do in the midst of a baby formula shortage? Well, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a pretty thorough page on how parents can get through this shortage. Basically, if you can't find it in stores or online or in social media groups or from friends or acquaintances or from your pediatrician, there are milk banks where lactating women do donate surplus breast milk that is certified as safe for consumption. Also, if the baby is older than six months, it's okay for them to have whole cow's milk for up to a week. Pasteurized. Yes, <laughs> uh, though it's not ideal and you should definitely talk to a doctor first. 
Uh, other than that, the U.S. military is literally airlifting formula shipments from other countries into the U.S. right now. So hopefully that eases the shortage, but uh, it could be a while before things are back to normal. Got a pretty fragile sort of uh, status quo in this country. Uh, it's kind of uh, kind of alarming how yeah, one, the... one baby formula uh, operation gets shut down and uh, suddenly uh, we're not sure if our babies are going to fucking live. That's the thing, though. It was shut down from everything I've seen for the right reasons because yeah, it, no, it, it was a contamination. But it's like... I mean, look, I'm not going to say this is Joe Biden's fault, but this is the kind of thing where the, the second the government shuts down a baby formula manufacturing plant, they there should, should immediately, funds immediately, there should the immediately yeah. be like uh, the understanding that this is going to cause uh, bottlenecks in the supply chain and a plan should immediately be put in place to uh, alleviate that. And it does not seem like that happened. Like, hey, the uh, one factory shut down. I heard uh, it. I first heard about this. Like, I don't I don't have a baby. I don't know a lot of people who have babies. I first heard about this from just like randoms on, on Twitter. And then after that, like someone asked Jen Psaki at a White House meeting. And she like the first time she was asked about it, she like didn't even seem to know it was She's halfway out the door. Isn't she already replaced or no? Uh, she uh, yeah, she might be. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's just like it's like this shouldn't have snuck up on us. No, well, if anything, we've said before, the last three years have shown just how fragile every bit of normal life is. Yeah. And uh, I don't think, I don't want to be a doomer, but it doesn't seem like we're taking the right steps in order to counteract that problem in the future. It seems like things are just going to keep getting worse or just like patched together briefly until another vital thing yeah. falls by the wayside. Yeah, like, can you imagine this country if, like, in the midst of an actual crisis, like, a war on our own soil or something like that, or, like, a disease that's actually, like, more on, more on the Ebola side than the COVID side, like, it would, it, society would collapse in a matter of days. Like, we, we can't handle it. We're too soft. <sighs> Anyways, oh, yeah, what was that? Uh, yeah, there's also a new disease going around to get everyone worried. Uh, Monkeypox. That sounds fun. Mm hmm but it's not. Uh, you've heard of chicken pox. You've heard of smallpox. There's a there's a new pox in town, baby. Uh, and it's apparently pretty similar to smallpox, which was successfully eradicated thanks to global vaccination efforts in the 20th century. We did it. And I don't think we're ever going to do it again. But uh, thankfully, it's, it's a lot less severe than smallpox. It has a fatality rate at around 1%, which is low, but it's like COVID levels. No, COVID was like 1% uh, gets hospitalized. And of that 1%, Dies. Okay. So yeah. it's like it, it's an order of magnitude off. Mm -hmm. It's definitely worse than COVID. But uh, so the symptoms usually begin with a fever and flu like symptoms 13 days after exposure. And then a few days later, skin lesions develop all over the body, particularly the face and hands. So a lot like smallpox. Uh, thankfully, though, it's not super contagious. Uh, it spreads via direct contact with skin lesions or things that they've touched or through the air. But it's only like if you're having a prolonged face to face conversation with someone and just breathing into each other's mouth directly. And that's all, also only once the person is already displaying symptoms. Yeah, there's a because of the pandemic, I follow a couple of like epidemiologists on Instagram and TikTok. And I know you're not supposed to get your information from those places, but the, these people were the ones yeah. that were sounding alarm bells at, like at every and right all the time about the way that COVID was working. And they're just like, okay, yeah, this is a, it's a problem. Yeah. It's, it's not, not what you think <laughs> when you're thinking of like what we just dealt with. Yeah. It's not the same, not but really also comparable, but also keep your uh, eyes peeled. Yeah. It's bad. Like this is not a disease we should be seeing outside of like the parts of Africa where it kind of flares up every couple of years. It's not good that we're seeing it spread like this, but don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it does have epidemiologists a little baffled uh, at how quickly this current outbreak has managed to spread across several different countries. Some were initially concerned that this was a new version of monkeypox, but that doesn't seem to be the case. But here's Wired with one theory on where this outbreak came from. It seems more likely that this outbreak has stemmed from a flare in cases within parts of Africa, combined with a spike in air travel following the end of pandemic restrictions, and waning immunity against orthopox viruses, the viral family that contains monkeypox, cowpox, smallpox, and others, across large swaths of the planet. Jamie Lloyd Smith, a University of California Los Angeles professor who has been studying monkeypox for more than a decade, says immunity against this family of viruses has been declining in humans ever since smallpox was eradicated in 1980. Eradicating smallpox stands as one of the greatest public health accomplishments of all time, he says, but a natural consequence of eradicating the one orthopox virus 
that circulated widely among humans and then stopping the vaccination program that led to eradication is that generations of people have no immune experience with any orthopox virus. There is no question that this makes life easier for monkeypox. It's like a big pile of fuel that has never seen a spark. Yeah, we did such a good job eradicating smallpox that we did kind of pave the way for another pox to eventually maybe create a problem. But because they're so similar, and a monkeypox vaccination effort would actually be pretty simple. And there's already... No, like, <laughs> I don't think so. I'll take my chances. Okay, Joe Brandon. You just said that uh, if I had natural immunity, this wouldn't be a problem. No, that's not what I said at all. Only sheep get the monkey pox. It's called sheep pox. Yeah. I asked for what... We're joking, Susan, yeah, from yeah, YouTube. Yeah. As for what the specific spark that set this off was, uh, it's a bit delicate. So there, there's speculation based on the fact that a lot of the first patients in North America and Europe were gay men that close contact via sexual promiscuity could have been a factor. Though scientists are very quick to point out that this is not a gay disease, even if uh, that hypothesis turns out to be the case. Uh, we learned a lot of things from HIV AIDS. And uh, yeah, calling something a gay plague is, uh, is not a good thing to do, especially when there's, uh, there's nothing about the disease that uh, you know, checks whether you're, what your sexual orientation is. Uh, you can just as easily get this thing if you're not gay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, at least for now, there isn't much worry that this is going to snowball into something we're going to have to really worry about because uh, monkeypox simply is not anywhere near as transmissible as COVID. Uh, the Omicron variant is 10 to 20 times more transmissible than monkeypox. And hopefully that's true and remains to be the case. Uh, we don't need another pandemic. We're full. We've had enough pandemic for one lifetime. You're only supposed to have one every you know, couple decades. And uh, you're coming at with me with this monkeypox shit? Get out of here. No. Uh, you're acting like we haven't had like the third or fourth financial meltdown uh, in our generation either. Yeah, but those you can pretty much time. Like, you look at the, the, the you, look at, you look at the timeline, it's like, yeah, we, we were absolutely due for another recession. Yeah. What were you all thinking? Oh, there's never going to be another recession. Come on. No, that's what we were thinking, right? It's time for millennials to finally start saving some money and yeah. seeing those returns, right? Yeah. Nope. Yoink. Why aren't you investing your money in everything, including the most risky possible? Like, look, the line only goes up. Your entire life, since you first became aware of things outside the classrooms in circa like 2010, uh, the line has always gone up and gone up and gone up. What are you doing? Keeping your money in the bank like a fucking loser. There's a meme this week where it was just like the person driving a car staring dead eyed and like when your friend starts driving 150 miles an hour on the freeway and tells you that he bought Sp uh, Shopify at 1500. <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. Yeah, yeah. I just stopped looking at my my portfolio. Out of I'm sight. Like, out yeah. Of <laughs> it's like there's no point. Target date growth fund. I'm you know, I, I don't need the money, which is, is good. You shouldn't very, you shouldn't yeah. invest money. You're not going to need anytime soon. And I my investments are safe enough that I know they will eventually, uh, you know, dance <laughs> yeah, back. Sure. Somewhere. Except for Netflix, which I bought. I bought one share of Netflix like five years ago, and it is somehow down from it's below what I paid for it five years ago. Like how that doesn't usually happen. Usually it's like you bought it six months ago and you're like, well, shit, turns out that was the peak. Whoops. Target date growth fund. That's all I, I, I have like a bunch of. Uh, other but the, everything's down so it's like okay well yeah. oh no i i bought a square stock and it's down but so is everything else like it's like w there's no winners to pick just put your money in spy not uh, right now. i don't know not now don't don't just keep your money but yeah hold on to it you'll need it etfs individual stocks nah. etfs <laughs> anyways uh enough stock talk that's it we're taking a break uh we're gonna we're gonna have a nice little break on the channel so if you don't see any videos in the next uh, week or two that's why we're just, uh, you know, ha almost halfway through the year. We need a break as much as you do. Yeah. Give me uh, a break. <laughs> Give me a break. In the meantime, we have an entire five months of videos. What are yes. we? We've probably done like 100 videos so far this year. Uh, it's something like that. Yeah. More, it's more than that, actually. Well, it's, it's a lot. And a you lot. can watch all of it. Uh, just go back to January 1st and start watching all the way through. But more recently, we do have uh, a, a recent episode of Weekly Weird News. We got uh, an episode of News Dump that you should check out. And uh, if, if you're feeling so inclined, click the join button. If you're not subscribed already, 
click the subscribe button, leave a comment, leave a like. Enjoy the next uh, week or so. Yeah, you'll be fine. You'll be fine without us. And then when we get back, we can... And no news will happen. When we, when out of we, sight, out of mind. When we get back, we can all uh, try to make sense of this crazy world once again. Yeah. Videos are up there now. Check them out. We'll see you soon. Thanks for letting us take a break. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.